I invite you to open a Bible to John chapter 1 as we are in the middle of a sermon series called The Heart of the Church where I'm sharing with you and we are praying and working as a congregation and asking God to lead us in a new direction to give us new hearts and to give us obedience to the Holy Spirit that we would be a congregation that seeks above all things to obey and fulfill the Great Commission. And over the last couple of weeks, we've been looking at different stories. And the first is that Jesus gave us this promise that when we seek out just one person and just one person comes to Jesus, that, that all of heaven rejoices. Right, that, that's not just a nice idea, that that's actually a promise from Jesus himself that, that even one conversation, one prayer, one invitation can make an eternal difference in someone's life and that we want to be as a church, a church that throws a lot of parties in heaven. And then last week as we looked at a story of, of a group of men who had a friend that they loved and they were motivated by two things, their love for their friend who was paralyzed and in need of healing and that their belief in Jesus, that he could actually do a miracle. And so we have a desire as a church to say, we're going to do whatever it takes to get the people that we love and care about to Jesus because we believe that Jesus is still alive and still doing miracles and still changing lives. Now, if you're a member of our Savior, you're probably really glad this morning to show up and realize I didn't actually cut a roof or a hole in the roof like I promised I would. All right, I didn't do it. I thought about it. But the idea from that story was that we would be a congregation that said, well, if that's what it took to bring one person to Jesus, to see the angels in heaven rejoice, that we would do it, right? And we, we took time to repent and confess of whatever obstacles or idols in our hearts that get in the way of our mission and purpose of seeing people brought to Jesus. And this morning, as we look in this story of John 1, where Jesus is getting some disciples early on, I want you to see a pattern, because as we think about, well, how do we bring people to Jesus, or we think about the Great Commission, if we're honest, sometimes it is overwhelming. Now, that sounds impossible. But what we see in God's Word is this simple pattern, which is, come and see. That's the invitation. We just simply tell somebody, well, just come and see. That's what we see repeated in this story. And then after we believe in Jesus, as we as followers of Jesus, our job is to go and tell. Right? And so what you end up with is this pattern of telling people, come and see, and then people having their lives changed and transformed by Jesus, and they go out and tell others and say, well, you, you can come and see as well. And so John 1, starting in verse 35, um, I am using a different Bible translation than the one that's printed for you because I like messing with y'all. Um, also, because this is my favorite translation, so, you know, deal with it. You'll still be able to understand. All right, verse 35 of John 1. Again, the next day, John was standing there with two of his disciples gazing at Jesus as he walked by. He said, look, the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Jesus turned around and saw them following and said to them, what do you want? So they said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? And Jesus answered, come and you will see. See, so the pattern of inviting people into a life with Jesus, into, into being a disciple of Jesus, Jesus even begins it by saying, just come and see. C come and learn. Come and see who I am and what I offer you. So he does this with these two disciples, and they go, and they stay with him. And in verse 40, it says, Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus. So Andrew receives the invitation of come and you will see. And then he goes out, and he finds his brother, Simon Peter. And he found his brother Simon in verse 41 and told him, we have found the Messiah. We've, we've found the Christ. We've found the Savior. So Andrew brought Simon to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, and you will be called Peter. So what you see is Andrew living out this pattern that we see that we receive the invitation of Jesus in our own lives, that he invites us to a life with him a life of forgiveness and grace and mercy, a life that lasts forever. 
And then we see in Andrew's life that he's motivated by two things that we talked about last week. He's motivated by what? One is a belief that Jesus is who? Messiah. That he's the Savior. He's the Christ. He's the one. And what's the other thing that he's motivated by? A love for Simon Peter, his brother. So what we see throughout Scripture is that the, the motivation for the Christian is twofold. A love for people who do not know Jesus yet, who have not been invited to come and see, to, who have not received that new and eternal life that he offers. And we're also motivated by a belief that Jesus really is who he says he is, that Jesus really is the Savior. How many of you know the Bible verse, John 3, 16? Right? Show a hand, right? That's probably like, if you panic after church, when I ask you what's your favorite Bible verse, a lot of you are going to be like, John 3, 16, because that's a good one, right? <laughs> Without fail, I can know when someone's making up an answer, because you just go, uh, well, you know, John 3, 16 is pretty good. All right, now, it's a beautiful verse. If it's your favorite verse, that's wonderful because it's a huge promise of the gospel, right? I want to ask you another question, right? It says that God loves the whole world, right? The whole cosmos is the Greek word. It's, it's everything in the universe. So he sends Jesus to give what? Eternal life so that no one does what? Perishes. No one dies without him. So we love that verse. We, we, we know that verse, we know that promise. It's beloved and it's near and dear to our hearts. Many of us probably learned it when we were children. Here's my question. How many of you actually believe it? All right, a few hands. The rest of us are like, well, you know, it's nice. But here's what I mean. I don't mean that like to condemn you. I, I know you believe it. But oftentimes throughout my life, at least for my own heart, when I hear that verse, or when I would read that verse, or, or recite that verse, I was always only applying it to myself. Right? God loves the whole world. So he sent Jesus. So whoever believes in him, well, that's me. He loves me. Right? It's always used as, he loves me so much. That's what he did. And that verse includes you. And that's a wonderful gospel promise, right? That, that yeah, Jesus loves you enough that he came to earth to die and to rise from the dead to give you eternal life. But that verse is not only a promise for you. It's not only a promise for your family members. It's a true promise for the whole world. So what that tells us is that Jesus has a desire in his heart to see what? More and more people know his love, know his grace and his forgiveness. And his whole master plan for making more Christians is you. That's a big deal, right? You're like, <laughs> like you, some of you are probably thinking, I would have come up with a better plan. <laughs> or at least like an emergency break glass in case of emergency backup. I wouldn't put all your marbles in my basket, right? <laughs> like, but this is what Jesus does. And he's done it from the beginning with the disciples. He, he sees Andrew coming up to him, he says, well, you, you just come and see, and I'll show you. And when Andrew realizes this is the Messiah, he is motivated by his belief in who Jesus is, that he's the Messiah who really wants to save people, who really does love people who are far from God. And so he's also motivated by his love for his brother who at that time didn't know Jesus. I know he becomes Peter, the saint, and the apostle later on, but at the time, he didn't know Jesus. So Andrew runs and tells him about Jesus. So in verse 43, it says, On the next day, Jesus wanted to set out for Galilee. And he found Philip and said to him, Follow me. And we, we see this invitation of come and see. Like, follow me and I will show you who I am. Now, here's what I really need you to understand and like, and, and believe is that Jesus' plan for making more disciples is you. I know I said that earlier, I'm saying it again because repetition, right, is how we learn things. And so say it again, you're the plan. God's 
plan for changing the world with the gospel, God's plan for making more disciples, for more and more people knowing that Jesus loves them, is the church. And I've read the whole New Testament. There's not a backup plan. We're it. And when I say it's you, I'm emphasizing that. Because what we have nowadays is we've created this mindset, unfortunately, that it's me as the pastor, right? And I'm happy to pray with you. I am happy to talk with your friends about Jesus and your family members about Jesus. But God has placed you in their lives because he wants you to be like Andrew and be like, well, I found the Messiah. So I'm gonna go tell my brother, I'm gonna go tell the person I love that, that Jesus is the one. Now, for those of you who still don't believe me, because <laughs> my experience as a pastor, which has been over a decade, it was wild, right? <laughs> and this is a big deal, because I just had a birthday. And on yesterday, we had this wonderful LW Bell event and I had all kinds of wonderful LW Mel women coming up to me, none of them for our church because they already knew me, all right, coming up to me during the luncheon going, so long, how long have you been here? Like, how long have you been out of seminary? Because they all thought I had just graduated because I looked so young. And I gotta tell you, that makes an old guy feel really good, okay? <laughs> but my experience as a pastor is this, that so often, People will be like, Pastor, if you could just talk to them for me. I know it'll make a difference. And again, I, I'm more than happy to talk with them, have a meal with them, pray with, come alongside you and pray with them and pray for them. But I want to share with you some research. Lutheran Hour Ministries uh, worked with Barna Research Group to create a book called The Reluctant Witness. And it's all this research about spiritual conversations. And here's what they found. Because one of the things that we're hesitant about is, and we've talked about this, is sometimes we say no for somebody else, right? We get so nervous, we get so afraid, we build up the conversation or the moment in our head, we go, well, they, Peter doesn't want to hear about Jesus. So I'm just, gonna, I'm just not going to bring it up. And I don't want to make the family gathering weird. I don't want to risk the relationship or the friendship or how they're going to treat me. So, you know, it's just easier to not bring it up. Here's what they found though. 55% of non-practicing Christians and 55% of non-Christians, so they're either non-Christian, they don't believe in Jesus at all, or they're like, I go on Easter and Christmas, kind of Christians, all right? Now, here's what they found. 55% of both those groups were willing to have a spiritual conversation, but here's their preference. They said that the person they preferred to have a spiritual conversation with the most was a friend. That's you. You're their friend. God has put you in their life for a reason. This is the number one answer given by non-Christians by more than 30%. No, second place is 30% lower, which means like, it's the friend or nothing. Here's what they also found. Only 5% wanted to have that co same conversation with a pastor, which means your friend does not want to talk to me. <laughs> and I don't take that personally. It's okay. All right? It was one of the reasons I, I wear my clerical collar when I do hospital visits when I come here. Because when I get out there, everyone's like, that's a weird dude. All right? <laughs> and I want them to find that out after a little while, not immediately. <laughs> But I just want to share that again. 55% said, I'm willing and want to have my preferred preference is to have that spiritual conversation with a friend. Only 5% said, I'd be willing to have that conversation with a pastor. Right? It's almost like Jesus planned it on purpose that you, as his followers, would be his plan A for inviting other people to simply come and see who he is. Now what I love about this pattern, and we're gonna read it again with Philip and Nathaniel, is that each time the invitation happens, there's no debate, 
There's no argument. There's no like convincing, right? It's just, just come and see. What they are doing is they're letting Jesus handle the situation. One of the most common ways that I find for myself and I've heard from others that one of the reasons we don't initiate the conversation, the reason we don't give the invitation is because we are afraid of not knowing what to say, right? It's like one of the top excuses. Don't know what to say, not sure about everything the Bible says, not sure about these theological questions. What I love about this is the invitation is just, well, just come and see. And Jesus will take care of it. Like, like let Jesus be Jesus. Let, let Jesus be the one that changes their mind and their hearts. You don't have to put all the pressure on yourselves. So, verse 43, on the next day, Jesus wanted to set out for Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the town of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets also wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So this is Philip's way of saying, based on the Old Testament, we found the Messiah. We, we found the one that everybody's waiting for, every heart is aching for, that, that the world is messed up, but we found the one who's going to fix it and heal everything. Now that's the gospel, right? And you know that. You know John 3, 16. Problem is, not everybody goes, woo, I believe it now, right? If you've ever had a, one of these conversations, you've ever shared the gospel with somebody, you'd know that not every single time someone goes, thanks, let's get baptized. So what do we do when they're skeptical? What do we do when they ask questions or they're not like, yeah, okay, I get it now, right? And the answer is in this story. Nathaniel replied, and he's skeptic, right? He says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? That's a dismissive rhetorical question. He's like, nothing good comes out of there. It's a waste of time. To put it into our context, can anything good come out of religion? Can anything good come out of spirituality? Can anything good come out of church? And now when people ask that question, it's a rhetorical question, and their belief is what? Absolutely not. Just like Nathaniel, when he's like, can anything good come to Nazareth? He's expecting the answer to be no. Now here's what I love that Philip does. He doesn't go, well, open your Bible, please, and let me show you, Nathaniel, how at least one good thing can come out of Nazareth. Because if you are like me, sometimes we get nervous that, oh no, they're gonna ask a hard question, right? They're gonna be skeptical, and I'm not gonna be able to, hang on, it's in here somewhere. Anybody ever have that panic? So here's what Philip teaches us. Philip replies, come and see. Philip doesn't defend it at all. <laughs> he doesn't start quoting the Old Testament to him. He doesn't start making theological arguments. He's like, why don't you just come and see Jesus? Because Philip believes Jesus can handle it. Like Jesus can take care of it. Sometimes I think we are hesitant because we think, I've got to get this conversation right. I've got to nail this argument or it's never going to happen. And we forget that, that Jesus is the one who saves lives. We forget that Jesus is the one that changes minds and hearts and that, and that Jesus is powerful enough to do it even for the skeptic like Nathaniel. And that's what we see at the end of the story is that Nathaniel comes and he sees Jesus and he has a conversation. He interacts and he even argues with Jesus a little bit. And at the end of the conversation, Jesus has transformed it so much that Nathaniel calls him what? You're the Savior. You're the Son of God. Here's um, 
some more encouraging data for you from the reluctant witness. 55% of non-Christians stated that during their last spiritual conversation, they felt joy and laughed. Anybody ever not engaged in the invitation because you're like, this is gonna be a disaster and it's gonna be ugly? Or at least we build it up in our heads that way, right? Yet the majority of non-Christians have said, actually, I felt joy and I, I laughed with my friend during the conversation. And then they also found that 55% of non-Christians said they were definitely glad that they had their last spiritual conversation. Meaning the majority of people who do not know Jesus, who do not believe in Jesus, are still glad when their friend had a spiritual conversation with them. Now, they didn't ask how glad they were when a pastor walked up to them, but I'm sure it's probably lower. Right? I want you to take the pressure off of yourself. The evangelism, inviting people to Jesus, is not as scary and overwhelming as we build it up to be. We see this simple pattern with the disciples early on of, well, I found Jesus, and their evangelism technique is to go to their friend and simply say, you can come and see too. Right? They didn't quote a whole bunch of scriptures. They didn't become theological experts. And before you do your little cheating on this exam of, oh, well, pastor, they're the apostles, because I know some of you are thinking that because you're trying to weasel out of it. None of them are apostles yet. They're just fishermen. And later on, crowds will describe them as untrained and unschooled fishermen. Meaning, right now, when they are doing evangelism, you don't have the excuse of going, yeah, well, they were apostles chosen by God. And I'm just me. Because in this moment, they are just regular people. They are just regular fishermen. The only two things that matter about them as evangelists is this. They believe Jesus is actually the Savior. And they have people in their life that they love that they want to know Jesus. So raise your hand if you believe Jesus is the Savior. All right. Now raise your hand if you love somebody who doesn't know Jesus. Cool, you're in the Bible now. <laughs> Congratulations. Right, and here's the thing. There is a hurting, broken world out there filled with all kinds of people who need hope and kindness and grace and mercy, all kinds of people who need Jesus. And even though they might not explicitly say, I need Jesus, they are open and willing to have a spiritual conversation with a friend, meaning with you. And just like Andrew and just like Philip, you believe in Jesus, You're, you have a friend, you have someone you love and care for, and you are able to say the words, come and see. Let's just do that for fun, all right? On three, like you're in kindergarten all over again, all right? We're gonna say, come and see together. One, two, three. Come, come and see. see. Hey, look at you. You're a bunch of evangelists now. Isn't that cool? But we have to really believe this as individuals and as a church. John 3, 16 really is true. Jesus really does love those people. He really does love the whole world. And he has called you as their family member, as their friend, as the person in their life to be the one that invites them and says, come and see Jesus. I, I found all the life and the hope and the goodness that you're looking for in Christ. So come and see. 
And that's it. That's all you have to do. And then you trust Jesus to change their lives. Because that's what he's good at. One of my friends is uh, Annie, and she's not a Christian. And she was a living example of being a person that did not want to talk to clergy ever because she had a bad experience with clergy, which is great for me. Anyway, um, (laughs) and her experience was that so many times in her life, pastors, because of her background, would deceptively try to get to know her and be her friend, and then after a few conversations, immediately begin throw the Bible in her face and be like, this is why you need to know the Lord. And I remember the second time she and I ever met, we were having a conversation, she stopped me in a hallway after a meeting. And she looks at me and she goes, well, you're a pastor. I was like, yeah, I'm a pastor. And she goes, you're not gonna convert me or anything, are you? And I looked at her and I go, Annie, actually my tradition says I can't convert anybody anyway. That's up to Jesus. That's up to the Holy Spirit, which is true. You and I don't create faith in anybody. You're not the one that's like gonna convert them. That is the work of the Holy Spirit. That is the work of Jesus. He's the Savior, but he works through us. He works through our words. Now, the other thing about Annie is that she sighed the biggest sigh of relief ever. And after a couple of years, she said, you're the only pastor who have ever considered a friend. All right. Now, here's the deal. I want you to let Jesus be the one in charge of saving people. That's not your job. It's not my job. Our job is to go out into the world and simply be messengers and party inviters that say, we found the savior. We found the hope and the healing and the life you were looking for. Come and see him. And then you just, you let Jesus be the one that saves them and changes their hearts and minds. All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you indeed are the savior of the whole world, that you loved every single person so much that you came to give eternal life. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would fill us all with the Holy Spirit so that we would boldly go into the world and that we would share with as many people the invitation to come and see who Jesus is that we would share with the world the good news that we have found life and hope and forgiveness in Jesus. To your sweet name that we pray, amen.